no sports to deal with. We thought this was uh, probably our best opportunity to well, introduce you to members of the family. Really just kind of get to know us as more than just the fantasy analysts. One of the things that we talk about over at Fantasy Alarm as well is that family culture uh, that we love. So what better way for you guys to get involved and to be able to uh, to track down our boy Adam Ronis here and learn a couple of fun facts from him. Adam, well, dude, how are you, man? Let's start off with that. How, how are you doing? How are you handling the craziness? Because let's face it, it's friggin' crazy out there. It really is. I mean, I never thought that we'd be in this position with no sports at all. You know, usually in times of crisis, we have at least sports to escape to. So, the social distancing thing is just bizarre. You know, that's why I'm out in the desert trying to get away from everyone. You know, that thought that's the best place. Just trying to stay away from everyone. And yeah, it's just crazy right now. So we just got to hope that this turns around pretty quickly and everyone takes the proper caution. It's just crazy right stay now. Away. So we just got to hopefully we can get back to around pretty normal quick. as soon as possible. Although each day it feels like it's being extended. It really does. I mean, that's one of the things. I'm just opening up windows. Guys, this is your opportunity right now, by the way. Uh, I'll be on here. I'm going to keep Adam on here for as long as I possibly can. Oh, boy. Uh, and just share some, just share the information with you guys. So that way, if you have questions that you want to ask Adam, by all means, ask away. I think that's uh, it's a good, solid opportunity. Everybody uh, knows Adam Ronis, but do you really know Adam Ronis? Do you? Do we? Do I? So I figured, yeah, okay. Well, so, all right, you're social distancing yourself. You're sitting out in the desert right now, all lonesome. I'm in this, uh, what's it called? Shelter in, lockdown, something or other. I don't know, man. It's just, it's me, the wife, the, the, the dogs, the cats, a whole lot of toilet paper and not enough snacks. So you're not so, allowed to even go for like a walk at all? You just can't leave? I don't know. I, you know, I haven't even tried. My wife's actually at the vet with the dog, one of the dogs right now. So oh. we're just going to have to wait and see. I don't, I don't really know. I'm sure if there's an emergency. I can go out somewhere. I mean, what's going to happen? Am I going to drive down the road? Is there going to be a cop? Is going to pull me over? There's a sniper waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that has nothing to do with the coronavirus locked. <laughs> That's true. That's for some other reasons. <laughs> Let's face it. So, all right. So let's, uh, this is, this isn't about getting to know me. This is about getting to know you, Adam. So let's, let's, I mean, let's really, let's start off with how you are handling this sports moratorium, because let's face it, fantasy sports has been your life for, well, I mean, almost two decades now. And now all of a sudden to shut it down completely, what are you doing with yourself? Uh, it sucks. I mean, you know, I have stayed busy so far. I've been writing, you know, I did a recap of my Tout Wars draft that's up on Fantasy Alarm now. Still doing radio alarm after hours with Justin Fensterman. So I, I, mean, I still have things to be done. Like Sunday, I did an NFBC auction. You know, that was supposed to be live in New York. Obviously, they canceled all the live events and the big money drafts. But Andy Saxton, who's a high stakes player, decided to put an auction together instead of the uh, usual fee. It was about cut in half, and we got uh, a good – I got, obviously, 15 people together to do it. So I did that on Sunday. So, so far, you know, I've kind of stayed busy, obviously following all the free agency news in the NFL. So, so far, so good, but we know this is just the beginning. And, yeah, I'm going to do a fantasy baseball draft tomorrow night. I got an auction on Sunday. But after that, it's really going to hit because – how many drafts can we do? Uh, and you don't want to do so many because we have no idea when the season's going to be again. Is it going to be a 140 game season? Will it be a hundred? So, so far it has been fine. And I'm going to continue to churn out content because that's the thing. You know, there might be people who are behind on their fantasy baseball prep. You know, we're just going to give you a ton more information and you can never have enough. There's always stats and things that you can discover. And, and that's the goal is to put up content where, People can learn new facts every day and help them in their prep because uh, we do think there will be baseball at a certain point. I know, obviously, they're saying mid-May is the earliest right now. Starting to think maybe early June, and even that is kind of uh, optimistic at this point. So I think, you know, I was a little surprised because I put it to a vote in my home league, and the last I checked, we have 14 people. It was 8-3 in favor of continuing it. I thought it actually might be more split, and people were commenting that, it's good to get away from all the negative news that's going on, 
kind of get in the room and have something to do and occupy the time. So, so far, actually, it's been fine. Obviously, though, check back with me next week because that's what's yeah, really – You've been losing your freaking mind. I know. Because, I, I mean, really, like – you you walk into these drafts with the strategy of of what? Okay, Clevenger, Judge, Stanton, these guys, they're going to be available at the start of the season. We didn't think they were going to be. But, I mean, how do you value pitching? How do you value rookies? I mean, we thought guys like Dylan Carlson, Mackenzie Gore, um, whatever, name a rookie, Madrigal. Uh, and and are these guys even going to be brought up? Is it Does it make sense for the clubs to even start the – the clock, especially with that new rule in place that in September, rosters go to 28. They don't go to 40 now. So, I mean, how frustrating. I mean, it's, it's got to be frustrating for you. It's got to be. Yeah, look, it's a lot of guesswork. I mean, everyone is on the same page. Uh, so if everyone in the league decides that they want to go forward and do it, why not? But we're all in the same position. I mean, it's probably going to drive the prices up on some of those injured guys. Although I didn't really see that in the mixed league. Uh, tout auction on Sunday. Uh, I didn't think, you know, I think Judge went for 23, and that's an OBP league. So uh, Stanton, I think, was 18. Clevenger is clearly the guy, but I was already on him before this. Like, I did the Tout Wars Mixed League draft on March 3rd before any of this happened. And I had pick two in a 15 team league, and I took Clevenger at pick 32, second pick of round three. And probably people thought I was nuts, but the way I looked at it was, I don't think he's going to miss much time. Worst case scenario, it comes back into April. Unlimited IL spots in Tower Wars, and I'm playing for the long haul. I'm not just playing for the month of April. I don't need to win April. My goal is to be champion when the season ends. So that's why I was more aggressive on Clevenger. I even in the labor mix draft, which was end of February, well, technically March 1st, uh, that weekend, I took Clevenger at 16 or 17 bucks. So I wasn't shied away from Clevenger. Obviously it looks better now, but you know, that's, that, that's luck. Uh, all this stuff, you know, people pounding their chest. Oh, I got Aaron judge for 12 bucks. All right. You got lucky. Let's be honest. You know, right. we all know luck plays a factor in fantasy. And I've always said the goal is to kind of try and eliminate as much luck as possible. But if you did drafts early and you got those guys at a discount, it's not because you were smart. It's because you got lucky. Because you took a chance is really what it was. You took a chance. You figured, okay, I'm getting them at a at a at a bit of a discount here, and I'm going to do it. I went through that with um, uh, what was it? Oh, Ariel Cohen from uh, from Fangraphs, and he was talking about the fact. And I guess he just he he wasn't choosing his words the best way, and he was talking about you know that it was a good bet, and he's going to turn a profit. And I mean, listen, yes, there are some people who are like, you know, Ooh, you're talking about profiting off of a, of a pandemic. Blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm like, I, thank you, Twitter, for being the social media cesspool that you are. Uh, we appreciate that. But, you know, the, the thing about it is, is that you did take on a certain amount of risk. You took, uh, you know, a, a value pick and it is panning out for you. It, it really is. We're not trying to profit off of a pandemic, but. I mean, listen, if I'm going to get it's more luck, though, because sure, the season, you know, the season was supposed to begin on the 26th and those guys wouldn't be ready. We know that. So it's luck. I mean, because this is something that we never saw coming. No one saw no baseball for this much amount of time. So, you know, that's luck. Now, if you do the draft today and you get these guys at a bargain and you outsmart everyone else that works out, there's a little bit more skill involved because you at least have the news. We still don't have an exact set date, but I'd give people more credit who are doing it today. If you did it before all this came, you know, you got lucky. I think, I don't know, Stanton was like maybe eight bucks in that mixed league labor auction. Right, right, yeah. And, but again, that that's, that's luck because, you know, he could have missed a month, a month and a half, and then come back two weeks and get hurt again. Like he usually does. So, oh, come on, dude, you know, low hanging fruit, dude. You're well, better than that. You're better I don't than that. Happened, but your Yankees are starting to resemble the Mets when they used to have all those injuries. <laughs> like, what happened? <laughs> was, maybe that virus was sent to the Yankees locker room because that's what the, this was the Mets for years. Everyone hurt all the time, and now it's the Yankees. Ah, uh, remember, remember your 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 trio of greatness. What was it? Bill Pulsifer, yeah. Isringhausen. Who was the third? Uh, Wilson. Right. Paul Wilson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. oh, look at that. 
I'll always have that. I, at least I can I can take some solace in, in, in that one there. But yeah, listen, it's definitely it is luck, and you know. So all right, let me set the uh, I'll set the over under on first day of baseball at June sixth. You take it before or after? Uh, I'm gonna say after. Wow. I hope I'm wrong. I, I really hope you are too. I really hope I'm wrong on that. I will don't mind losing that bet at all. I mean, I want to get some sports back as soon as possible because, yeah, you know, this is crazy. And I'm sure people are going to start checking on me. Be like, are you OK? There's no sports. Like, what are you going to do? I mean, I do do other things, but most of it is sports. I mean, I center a lot of what I do around sports. I mean, I'm watching games every single day because, you know, I'm hardcore into NBA, MLB and NFL. And not a lot of people are, you know, a lot of people in this industry are really only football guys. And I honestly think that's why they were looking to the XFL to kind of salvage them because they did, they're they very, you know, moderate fans in the other sports. Will they watch the NBA? Maybe in the playoffs or the finals, but they really don't watch it. They don't watch baseball. So for those guys, I think that's why they were kind of gravitating to the XFL, just my opinion. Like for me with the XFL, I just didn't have time for it. I'm like hardcore in the NBA, watching it every day, NBA sports betting. I mean, started putting the picks up on Wager Alarm and, I don't know, 11, 12 games over 500. So I was doing it. So in order to be good at that, you got to watch the games. you got to follow what's going on. And I'm doing fantasy basketball. I'm prepping for baseball. I'm still, you know, doing football stuff. So for me, you know, I'm really hardcore into those three sports. And that just takes up a lot of time. And then, of course, you know, I'm, I get into March Madness. So I was going to watch college basketball. So oh, yeah. There was just so – there's always something – going on for me. I don't have the break that other analysts do. I mean, I, the people who just do NFL, I mean, I, I know it's year round now and there's always something going on, but, you know, try doing that and baseball and basketball. It's, it's not easy. You know, there's just not a lot of free time. So for me, I always had something like at, at any point of the year, any day on the calendar, there was something going on for me. Outside of maybe what's the one the baseball all star break? Maybe is the only time where there's really nothing going on. So yeah, this is a, a shock to my system for sure. Uh, well, let's let's see if we can take care of you a little bit here and help you. Out. Let me ask you. All right, so Friday night you went to bed early. This let's talk this past weekend. So Friday night you went to bed early because you had to get up for uh, for the nine a.m. broadcast tried. for Tal. Right? I actually tried to go to sleep early, oh, but you didn't. You lied in bed. I lied in bed. Yeah, I lied in bed and tried to sleep, and it kind of didn't work. Were you alone? Yes. Okay. No, wait. Friday, Friday. Friday, Friday, I was alone. I had company earlier in the day. Okay. All right. Good, good, good. I'm glad, because then I didn't want to know what you were doing there, lying awake in bed by yourself. So, fine. So, Friday night. So, Saturday morning, you do the broadcast. Yeah. That takes you through from 9 to, what, like 2 in the afternoon? Two. Yeah. Okay. What would you do after that? Uh, I definitely went for a walk. Okay. I try to, since, see, I, you're working from home, hmm. you know, so basically been working from home for, I don't know what, three, about three years now, maybe four. So my girlfriend, ex-girlfriend last year was like, let me see your phone. And I was like, oh shoot, now I'm going to get caught with all the other girls I'm talking to. <laughs> but she looked at, you know how the phone keeps track of your steps? Yeah. So she was looking. She's like, man, you don't do anything. Like, it was like 2,000 steps a day. <laughs> and I never thought about it. She's like, damn, man, you, you got to, like, be active. So ever since then, I've been trying to walk every day. I'll take a walk, try it, like, about an hour um, to get, you know, anywhere from seven to 10,000 steps a day. So I took the walk after on Saturday. Then Saturday, oh, I hung out with my friend upstairs. His sister was visiting and he told me to come by. I hopefully none of them have this virus. Otherwise, I'm kind of screwed. But it was, you know, him, his girlfriend, his sister, his kids. We kind of just hung out, had some drinks, and that was Saturday night. And that was Saturday night. You so you were in bed by what? Eleven? No, no. Saturday night I was up <laughs> eleven. No, I was up later than that. Oh, and I was I watched uh, Homeland. It can't, it comes out on demand around midnight, so I was watching that. Oh, okay. All right. Binge watch. You're, you're, are you a TV binge watcher? I am, but I'm caught up to date on Homeland. Okay. That's a, that, the new episode came out Saturday night at midnight, so I watched that when what's it came new, out. What's the, what's the new one, then? What's, what's the problem? Because you know, you, I know you're a, a huge Curb guy. Love you know? Curb. I mean, I'm, I'm in, like, so, season four right now of Curb. And you like it, right? 
I love it. Well, all right. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. And, and, and you know what? You help me with this because this is something that definitely like New Yorkers definitely understand. Everybody who kind of grew up on Seinfeld knew what this is all about because Seinfeld humor and, and, Cur- and Larry David humor is one and the same. All right. It's like watching a Ben Stiller movie. You know, like a meet the parents type thing where it's like, what the F can go wrong now for him? I mean, and I and like every time Larry David opens up his mouth, I'm literally I'm like, don't 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 don't. He's going to say it. he's going to say it. I know he's going to say it. like that's the entire time. And I don't know if I can if, if like my sensitive constitution can handle that for how many seasons is it now? There, this is season 10. That so in I'm right. in season four. I don't know if my heart can handle this. You, trust me, you can't. And it gets better. You haven't even seen the introduction of J.B. Smoove yet, who I think really increases <laughs> it and makes it even better. So, yeah, I think it gets better. And a lot of people are saying the same thing, that this is one of the best seasons ever. It just keeps getting better. Unfortunately, though, the last episode of the season is this week. So it just sucks. We're getting only 10 episodes for the season because that is a show that I look forward to each week. But it is also a show that you can go back – and watch again. And I watched some of the earlier episodes in this season uh, Saturday as well. So, and another show that I love to watch, I don't know if you watch this show, Impractical Jokers, one of my favorite shows ever. And I got into this one late. Uh, I remember my friends like, oh, you got to watch this show. And I'm sitting there like, hey, whatever. This looks kind of stupid, whatever. And I'm watching, I'm like, wow, this is genius. I'm on, like, if I wasn't doing this show, like, if I wasn't in fantasy, I would want to do what they're doing. Now, do, do, are you familiar with the show at all? So I just saw a, a video of them where they had a guy who was a waiter and he was wearing these glasses that, that messed oh. up his depth perception. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's falling all over the yeah, place. That was Times Square at BBQs. Trying to like pour water into yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. So I saw that. So I, I get the I get the premise of it. Absolutely. Well, that was the ultimate punishment. So with the ultimate so here's how it is. It's four friends who grew up in Staten Island in high school. And this is, I think season, I think season eight just finished. So they, they basically pu- put through each other through punishments. And if you refuse to do it, you lose. And at the end of the episode, whoever loses the most faces the ultimate punishment where you cannot say no, you have to do it. And they know each other's fears and dislikes. So they can be really harsh with some of those punishments, but I like it because they incorporate real people, they go to malls, they go to the parks, and they involve people, and they don't know what they're gonna say. They have an earpiece, and the guys tell them in their ears what to say. And so you have no idea what's coming, so you either have to say it or you lose. Uh, and it's just hilarious. Like, I I love the show, I watch it over and over. Whenever I bring a new girl over, I make them watch it. I've gotten a lot of them into it. Like, if, they, if you kinda don't like that humor, we're probably not going to get along that well. Is I mean, look, you don't have to have the same interest, but I just love the humor. They just came out with a movie, and I saw it the first weekend because I love that. I, I don't go to the movies much, maybe once a year. There's never anything good, but I felt like I had to support them uh, just because I'm a big fan. You know, you know this. Anything that you like, it's the same people who are fans of us become members to support us. They like us. We give them good advice. It's the same thing. You know, those people support us. Uh, we appreciate that. I want to uh, uh, support Impractical Jokers. I wanted to see it do well because it only opened up in a select uh, theaters because they weren't sure I was going to do. It obviously did well. They opened it up across nationwide the following week. Um, so I went to go see it like on a Sunday uh, with my friend, even though his girlfriend was really upset for him leaving. But hey, whatever. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I would love to be on that show because I would probably do almost everything they tell me to do. Like, even if it involves sensitive stuff, because I, you know, I don't want to lose. You know me. Well, you, you, I hate losing. I'm so competitive. Yeah. I would not want to lose. So I would pretty much do everything that I was told to do on that show. They really have to come up with some stuff. But again, it's easy to say from your couch until you're actually in the situation and you don't know what's coming. And it's right there in your ear. So I know that people are like, oh, you wouldn't do everything. I'll tell you this. I would do most of it. But it is easy to sit and watch it and say, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that until you're actually in the situation. Because they have had times where uh, they've almost gotten beaten up and they have security on the set and uh, they jump in. So, you know, you you mess with the wrong person. 
you know, they might not respond kindly. All right. Well, because now I'm sorry, but now the wheels are turning. And now I'm thinking you, me, let's grab like Jed Piacenti. Maybe um, we can see if we can rope like Rick Wolf into something. Like, what? Why don't be- we? Um, Social distancing, though. What are we going to well, do? No, no. When we when everything gets back to normal again, FSGA conferences, That's... labor, town, like we all get together on a number of occasions. So, I I'd be down for it, and I it would I would fun. I will you say know, this: you you got to watch the show. They put a lot of money into the production. They have hit. It's a lot of hidden cameras too. You know, so they have cameras hidden everywhere. It's a lot of pre production. They definitely put a lot into it. And they all, you also have to come up with the, the storylines. It, it will take time. Watch it and you'll see. Like they'll, they'll be presenting. Uh, they do presentations for stuff in front of people. And they'll have like four people in the room. And the other guy makes the presentation for them. So you try to make it as crazy as possible so that people go, no, that's a terrible idea. So there's a lot of prep that goes into it. I, I'm just – I'm feeling what, it. I mean, you have free time. What, it's on True TV. They oh, pre- yeah. I have, I have tons of free time. Well, I'm so, oh, no, we're still, you know what, what's crazy is we're still working. Like, I feel like I still don't have that free time. Uh, it's, it's not as, it might not be as hectic. Like if this, if baseball was going on, we had spring training games and news. Yeah. We'd be inundated with stuff. We're still, I mean, I, I've, I'm still working. So it's not like I feel like, oh, I got nothing to do all day. I don't feel that way right now. You know, I'm still doing radio shows. You are too writing. So we don't really have to update rankings now. I was updating rankings like every day. Now I really don't have to update them, but we have more free time than we did. So I'm just saying, if you're not doing something you love, just turn on. It's on True TV, and they pretty much play it almost uh, most of the day. Um, just watch several episodes, and uh, hopefully you'll you'll gain an appreciation for it because I love it. It's like my one of my favorite shows. Is my so wife can, all, is I'm all about humor, man. I love that comedy and the spontaneous stuff slapstick to a certain extent also were yeah. you like a were you a big pink panther fan at all like i mean the the movies you say you don't go to the movies but right. as we were growing up you know were you a pink panther fan something like that naked gun movies naked gun yes yes okay but yeah i like a lot of and you know again this involves people and it's messing with people and just seeing people's reactions because they say crazy stuff and you, you see people react like they have this game where they're in an office and they call out like uh, fake names, uh, you know, puns on uh, body parts and everything. And people are just sitting there like, these are not real names. What are you doing? So they just do a lot of crazy stuff involving people. And I just love it. All right. All right. So Impractical Jokers, what what, what, are, what are we what are we binge watching next? So you're up to date on Curb. You're up to date on Homeland. Uh where are you? American Idol? Voice? I don't watch that. It's garbage. <laughs> it's because uh, you're single, dude. It's because you're single. Oh, so you're saying if I had a girl that I would watch it? Yeah, you would make that sacrifice. And, and it, it, it depends. Um, nah, I don't know, man. Uh, fortunately, none of the ones recently have forced me into that stuff. Because that would suck. That would really suck watching that. You're not supposed to be forced into it, Adam. You're supposed to want to do it because yeah, okay. they want to do it. Everyone gets forced into stuff to salvage relationships, unfortunately. I, I'm kind of not that type, which is probably why I don't have long-lasting relationships. <laughs> I hear you and Lisa Ann talking about that. Like, seriously. So so talk to me here. You've got obvious criteria jumping into a relationship. If, if a girl – you meet a girl. Let's say you go out to a bar. You're hanging out with your buddies. You meet this girl. You guys hit it off beautifully. She gives you her number. For where, where, where do you take her first? Like first date? Um, well, I got a good story for you. Oh, uh, do well, no. So the the last girlfriend I had, the first date, I had made plans to go somewhere in her neighborhood, and she said, "Oh, that place is really loud. We can go there, but it's probably not going to be good." So I go, "All right, well, just to let you know," and I was completely joking. I said, "Just to let you know, I am passing up on watching the NLCS." This was the Dodgers. This was two years ago. Who were they playing in the NLCS two years ago? It was like a game six or seven. Dodgers and I can't even remember. Cardinals. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. So something. I, I go. I'm giving. I'm gonna. I'm not watching the NLCS to hang out with you. 
And she goes, oh, well, we can go to like a sports bar and watch. I go, no, no, I'm just kidding. She's like, no, no, let me call this place, see if they have the game. I was like, wow. So she did. They had the game, went there. I said, yeah, don't worry. I'm not going to pay attention to the game. I just want to look up and see the score. And she did that. And I was like stunned. I was like, wow, you know, that is something you don't see. So that was a good sign. Um, But yeah, I let every woman know at the beginning, like, look, I watch a lot of sports. It's for my job, which is true. You know, NFL Sundays, that's it. Like, that's what I do all day. And one girl years ago, everything was good. And then football season came and I couldn't see her on Sundays. I told her, I was like, you know, I watch football all day. And she got mad and she's like, you know, I can't do this anymore. I go, why? It's like, because I can't see you on Sundays. I go, well, what does that have to do with anything? Like, I told you, that's my job. Friday night, Saturday night, I'll see you. Well, I'm just not used to this. So I go, okay, so if I was a lawyer or a doctor, it would be fine. But because my job is watching sports, it's a problem. So that was like five months in. And I was just glad to see it at that point because it was going to be a problem. And I'm not budging on that. You know, I'm not going to go to a coffee shop with you at 3 p.m. on a Sunday when the NFL is on. Just not going to happen. I want to be good at what I do, and I need to watch the games. When people are tuning in to a national radio show the next day, I can't be sitting there looking at the box scores. I need to give you something in that game that you didn't see. Like, well, yeah, he was going to score, but there was a pass interference play. Because people who consume our work, they can't watch every play because they have families, and they're out dealing with all that crap with their wife and kids that I don't have to deal with. So so I let people know from the beginning – any girl that this is how it is and if you want to hang out with me while i watch football you're more than welcome to but i don't think that's going to be fun for you you know and you know one girl was like oh no i'll hang out with you this and that of course at the beginning they're cool with it they'll sit there rub your feet you know lay on you but then what you get foot rubs yeah, I uh, like like early <laughs> dates and stuff. Like if, yeah. if I want to watch something on TV, I'm the one who has to do the rubbing. Like I have to like I have to I have to, you know, treat my glaucoma. Yeah, I know. And like sit and watch TV and 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 rub the feet. How do you get the foot rub? I got some charm. It works, man. Trust me. So I'm charming. <laughs> I'm cute and adorable. Yeah, but you've been married for what? 75 years? But it feels like it does. not Right? Feels- so, that's why. But so at the beginning, they're all they're, they're fine. And as time goes on, and I always tell them, I go, all right, you're, you're fine with it now. And then months later, there was an issue. Like, I was ignoring her, and she kind of walked out. I go, what? I told you how Sundays are. I'm going to be watching the games. So just get used to it. Again, this is my living, you know? And I think people don't see it. Be like, oh, you're watching football. That's a joke. Come on. But this is our jobs. It's it maybe OK. It's not as brain surgery, doctor. All right, fine. It's more serious there. But the bottom line is this is what I need to do to earn my living and be good at it. And I explain it up front. So this way there's no issues. OK, so first date, you have the talk. Um, did you ever see the movie Fever Pitch with Jimmy Fallon? Yes. OK, so so a girl meets you. Well, I mean, there's no real out of season for you. So I know. because basketball and, and baseball uh overlap with the end of football and it's always so so there is no real out of season for you so how all long is, what's that baseball all-star break they got four days they got yeah right <laughs> <laughs> Take sorry honey i gotta go to fish tour on all-star break man that's what oh. i'm doing um all right longest relationship how long has it been uh eight years on and off eight so it was well two, two okay breakups. Two breakups in there. How long were the breakups? Uh, first one was, I think, two years. Second one was a little over a year. And where were you in your career during this eight-year run? Uh, let's see. I think I was working at Newsday okay. as a high school writer, mostly high school sports, some pro sports. I was doing, let me see, when I met her first, I was not on Sirius yet. Met her at, oh, it's funny. Right when I started Sirius, we broke up uh, <laughs> about a month later. Wow, that's crazy to think. Um, yeah, so because Sirius started 2010. So, yeah, we broke up about a little, uh, like two, two years, four months, and then got back together, and I was still doing Sirius then. Um, and also uh, was during that time, also part of a startup company. 
that I was with Draft LA. Um, so I was, and then Roto Experts and stuff. So yeah, I was I was in the industry, but with her, she worked, went to school, had kids, so she understood what it's like to be busy. So we both compromised and you know made made time for each other when we could. But yeah, we were both really busy. Um, but it's kind of sometimes good to have someone because they understand it too. They're going through the same thing. So right. uh, that was kind of fine. And she was cool. She'd be like, do you have a game to watch tonight? I'd be like, yeah. So she let me chill in her room, watch the game, and she'd go in the living room with the kids. Okay. Are, are, are you a kids guy? Uh, uh, yes. And yes. I mean, I love kids. I have a lot of patience and I think you need patience with kids. You know, I got, re- I got really close to her kids when I met them. One was two, one was 11. So for the two-year-old, I grew a real bond with him. And he was a very friendly kid that liked to be around people and kind of needed that father figure in his life. So we got real close. Um, So that's always the difficult part is when you have to part ways. So uh, I am always have fun with my friends' kids. So, yeah, I am a kid's guy. It's just the situation for me hasn't been right to have kids yet. Uh, I don't know if it will be. We'll see. You know, things change. But they, the kids are a lot, man. I don't care what anyone says. And people with kids will argue with me. And, yeah, they know better than me. But kids take over your life. You know, You're like you can't you can't just see. I'm just so used to doing what I want when I want. I can go out when I want. If mm-hmm. I need to go out to a bar, a club, a con- I can go whenever I want. Obviously, as long as my work is done. Uh, but I can pick up and go whenever I want, however I please. When you have kids, you can't do that, right? I mean, you can't. Right. Your kids come first. So that's the part for me that is just going to be really tough. Uh, I know we all go through changes in our life, um, but I'm not at that point yet. We'll see. Maybe when I'm 60, I'll have a kid. How old are you? Uh, I turned 42 in April. Okay. I got time, right? <laughs> you do, actually. I mean, I might have a kid in the next month or two with the what, what we got going on here. We're gonna. Right, have you a- got nothing else to do. You might as well. Kid in December, man. There's going to be a lot of December babies in December or January. This world is going to get – I know we're going to lose people, unfortunately, with this, but we're going to get a lot more at the end of this year. We're repopulating. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. We're repopulating the species right when now. When all your friends are sending you <laughs> baby shower invitations later this year, you're going to know why. Uh, you know, they don't send them to me anymore. They know. Like, uh, you know. like My wife and I, you know, very close with my niece and nephew. And it's my wife's sister's kids. And when we were living in, in New York, they used to, they were in Connecticut. And the kids, they used to bring the kids in on Friday. The kids would stay with us Friday and Saturday, sleep over again. on, And then Sunday morning, they would come and they would pick up the kids. Like, I it never failed. Saturday, probably around 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I was like, just come take them back right now. Come, why don't, you, why don't you come into the city? I'll buy you guys dinner if you come into the city and you just take your stupid kids away from me. Like, so you're because, not a kid's guy. What? You're not a kid's guy then. But see, I oh, am, but it's not a time. real small doses. Right. Real small doses. So... Um, I've actually, we got a couple of questions coming in here. Are you ready for this? Let's go. Oh, I don't know if you're ready for this. <laughs> I don't know if you're ready for this. No, it's not that bad. Um, well, Jen Piacenti is actually watching here. She wants to know, uh, ask Adam, what are the best seats he's ever had at City Field? Oh, uh, this is a, this is unbelievable. Is this uh, a setup? It is a setup because <laughs> it's probably, as I recall, with Jen, Jen had tickets and invited me to a Mets game. And there was like, I don't know, seven, eight rows right behind home plate. Um, so that's why Jen asked that. Is she wanted to get her name mentioned and got credit. Yes, thank you, Jen. That was even before we worked together here at Fantasy Alarm, maybe two, three years ago. I think I actually went to a game with her twice. Uh, because I remember I was at the game with a friend and I had told them like, yeah, uh, my friend is here and she's got tickets for me to move down, but I'll just hang out with you. He decided to leave early. I'm like, all right, cool. Now I'm going to hit up Jen and go down there. So, yeah, Jen did hook it up, I think, at least twice. I went to games with her. Uh, I think even one was like fireworks night. And, uh, yeah, they were really good seats. So thank you, Jen. Uh, well, better seats at City Field with Jen or better courtside seats for NBA with Lisa Ann? Oh, that's a tough one because the seats with Lisa Ann, and I put it on my Instagram and Twitter, Instagram, Aaron88. Uh, those were good seats. We were two rows behind the Golden State Warriors bench. 
I shot some video footage. Oh, man, that's a tough one. Probably the basketball, just because two rows behind the bench. Um, but the baseball seats were great, too. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it's When you're that close and you could see and hear the sound of the baseball hitting the glove, and especially when you're right behind on plate, you could see how fast the pitches are and the movement. Uh, and they're great seats. So both were good. But there's just something about an NBA game when you're right there on the court, two rows behind the bench. And, you know, I didn't even know there was a rule. So I'm taking pictures during the timeout of the huddle security's like no no you can't take pictures dude i didn't even know that so i had to stop but oh because what you're recording the inner conversation that they're having or something like that you know nowadays after what the astros did i guess everyone is on alert you know <laughs> so i didn't know that i was like oh okay sorry but like during the game action you know i got a nice drive with spencer dinwiddie driving to the basket but yeah being that close up is just uh you know i i was i did that covering high school sports but Big difference between high school sports and a NBA pro game of, of just seeing that action up close. Two rows behind the bench. Uh, how are you seeing over these guys who are like these behemoths? There, I, I stood behind Bill Walton at a dead show long ago, far away, and I mean, I got a great view of his lower back. No, no <laughs> tramp stamp on Bill, <laughs> but that's really that's what I saw the entire show. I mean, how do you? I mean, are, are you raised up a little bit there? No, but we were fortunate that night Golden State made a trade and they were really shorthanded. I think they only had four guys on their bench. And Steph Curry was not on the bench for the first half. He came out for the second half to watch the game. So maybe I guess we got lucky that uh, the bench guys were really not in front of us. And they only had like four guys on the bench that night because uh, a couple guys, uh, Glenn Robinson and Alec Burks were traded that night. Um, have you ever sat in those courtside seats like uh, Larry David did when he tripped Shaq? No, that would have been fun. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have uh, the money that Spike Lee has or any of those guys. And uh, no one has invited me yet. But hey, if anyone has those seats and uh, we resume basketball in a decent amount of time, I'm, uh, I'm game to go. Come take Adam Rodas to a basketball game, please. Anybody, you lovely ladies out there, if you're a eligible bachelor here, um, well, you are single right now, right? Yes, I am. Okay, you're not dating anybody in particular. Um, there's women that I talk to. Okay, well, you know, all right, women that you're playing the field, playing right. the field. That's See, fine. It was out there because uh, no, I'm, I'm now, man, with this car. I mean, this is bad for me, man. What, this quarantine? Yeah, these some of these women are scared to come out. Like, just come over for a couple of hours. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> it's a couple of hours? I'm like, stop by 10 minutes. Come on, talk. <laughs> Be really quick. <laughs> In and out. Don't worry. You, you won't even just wash your hands. Do it. Finish. Even wash your time to wash your hands. It'll be done. It'll be good. You'll be home. You'll be home before you know it. Uh, Jed wants to know if she should... Uh, nominate you do you watch the bachelor because she wants to know if uh, you'd be interested in being nominated uh it depends on the women that are on there because i have a certain taste uh so some of the women might not be what i want so we need to i need to see the screening of the women you know send me their pictures <laughs> and, and then i'll decide if i'm going on because i'll probably eliminate like 80 percent of the field immediately Wow. Oh, really? Yeah. A very particular type Adam Rodas yes. had. Very specific. Okay. All right. Well, ladies, you're going to have to just take your chances and see what <laughs> happens. Follow him on Twitter, at Adam Rodas. Slide into his DMs with a little picture, and, uh, and he'll be able to just weed you out, in and out. Exactly. There you go. Okay. Good, good, good. <laughs> That's great news. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Well, we're sitting here. We're meeting the families. Adam Ronis, obviously, you guys have tuned in. Uh, hit us up. We're live on Periscope, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, ask any questions you want. We are more than happy. Adam's willing to answer anything he said. 100 anything, right? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what. Well, here you go. Before we get to uh, to any more questions, which I'm sure your loving audience would be uh, happy to dote upon you there. How about this? Let's talk about how you got into the into this business. Let's talk about the the, the transition because obviously we know we talk about this all the time. It's it's a very popular 
question that everybody asks is how can I break into the industry? Now, when you were breaking into the industry and I was breaking into the industry, like totally different ball of wax. There weren't podcasts everywhere. There weren't a billion websites. So talk to me. How did you get involved? Um, yeah. I mean, college, you studying journalism in college? Well, I always wanted to be involved in sports, whatever I, I was going to do. I knew that from a young age. And I don't know how I got into sports like that because my father passed away when I was four years old and I grew up with my mom and two sisters. So I grew up around women and I was a huge sports fan as a kid. I remember going to the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, seven years old, in a Mets uniform with the socks and everything, pants, hat, and I hate, and this goes to show you, it had nothing to do with the Yankees winning. This was like the mid 80s. And I despised the Yankees as a kid then, and they weren't winning. And I went and took a picture. I probably have it somewhere. I got to find it. I took a picture of the ba- in front of the Babe Ruth statue, and I put a Mets hat in front of Babe Ruth's face to cover him up and took a picture. So that was me as a kid, okay? So it Disrespectful, has- okay. No, so you're a disrespectful child. I hated the Yankees, and I mm-hmm. still do. Has, okay. nothing to do with, has nothing to do with them winning. Everyone says you're jealous. No, this was in the 80s, and I was seven years old. So – I always was into sports. When I got to high school, um, well, my mom never really let me play Little League as a kid. I was very skinny, and she thought I was going to get hurt. Finally, I begged to play high school football. She let me play. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Uh, so I played high school football. Um, what but position? I, what? A position. Wide receiver and defensive back, obviously. Like, what else am I going to Is it obvious? I don't know. But I can't, I'm not playing running back. I'm not if playing you turned around and said I was the punter or the place kicker, I would have been all in on that. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, so I realized, all right, this is not going to – I'm not going to play sports in college or at a pro level. So uh, I was a pretty good writer. So I actually started uh, writing for the high school newspaper and then went to college and uh, minored in journalism, major in media studies, writing for the school paper – intern for some uh, weekly papers in Queens. And then right after I graduated, started working for Newsday, started off in the in the New York City edition. Uh, they transferred me to Long Island for a year, back to the city, which is what I preferred. I got to cover like Sebastian Telfair, uh, Charlie Villanueva, both guys went to the NBA. Um, wound up covering Steven Matz and Marcus Stroman uh, out in Long Island. Uh, so someone who was working there, was starting up a fantasy site and said, hey, because he knew I played and I always did well in the in the Newsday Leagues, you want to write for it. So I asked my sports editor. He said, no. I'm like, why? It's like, oh, it's conflict of interest. You know, we might send you to cover Jets or Giants and use that info. I'm like, you guys never sent me to cover the Jets and Giants. He's like, well, we might. So then the Sunday editor is like, do you want to write a fantasy baseball column every week for the paper? I was like, sure. So every Sunday had a fantasy baseball column. Then football season came. I did football and then uh, blog talk radio uh, started doing a fantasy sports channel. So I think it was Paul Greco at the time reached out to me, said, hey, you want to do your own show? I'm like, sure. So I started I did my own show one hour uh, once a week and a half hour once a week. And then Scott Engel reached out to me and said, hey, I seen you write for Newsday. I see heard you on a podcast by yourself. Pretty good. You want to come do stuff for Roto Experts? I'm like, sure. So I started doing stuff with them. And then in 2010, uh, they were getting a show on Sirius. And I actually, I was not supposed to be a part of that show. It was Scott and someone else. And at the last second, that guy bailed. And they were like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Scott's like, I got the guy. And it was me. Um, so I started doing the morning show in 2010. Uh, and I, I wasn't good at first. You know, I think it took a while for me to come out of my shell and let my personality come out. But I also had radio background. I went to the Connecticut School of Broadcasting in 2002, and Kevin Burkhart was my instructor. I'm sure you know him from Fox, and mm-hmm. you know he was a guy that was selling cars at the time, and he just uh, went to WFAN and then SNY, and now nationally on Fox. I mean, guy's great. So he was my instructor, um, and he always helped me out. Uh, he actually had me come into uh, WCBS 880 and work on a demo. So. You know, I got good instruction from people and I actually started doing um, in in New Jersey high school uh, football in Sussex County. I did a pregame show, halftime and postgame and ran the board and took uh, calls from stringers. So I was basically doing, you know, how we have 
we have a host, we have produ- I was doing everything. I was, you know, recording the stringers calling in, piping into the play by play guys, hey, we got an update from here. They throw it to me, I'd play the update, throw it back. So I was doing all that, doing, you know, pregame, halftime post. And I did that for three years, basically making no money. I drove 60 miles. Uh, so the money I was making went for gas and tolls. Um, right. But it was experience. And, you know, I think we've had these discussions on Twitter. I think even you had one recently with people. A lot of people like, oh, I'll never work for free. But the thing is, a lot of us who are here now, we did or got very little pay. I mean, the first couple of years that I was on Sirius, I got nothing. All they did was pay for was my transportation. But for me, I looked at it as, hey, here's an opportunity to prove yourself because no one knew who I was back then. This is an opportunity on national radio to show what I can do. The door is budged open. Now it's up to me to kick it down and prove myself. And obviously, I think I did that. But there was very little uh, payback or financial rewards early on. Uh, It took a while for that to occur. So, you know, that's what people are saying. I know there's I'll never work for free. I don't want to do it. And I understand everybody's situation is different, but a lot of us did. A lot of us didn't make anything when we first started out to get where we are now. It's just not handed to you. You know, you have to kind of establish yourself, self, and prove yourself. Well, I mean, yeah, I think that that's the the, the biggest issue there is that I think people are misled to believe that uh, the money that fantasy sports does make, that it does generate, um, it's not about the you know it's not about the, the going towards paying for content i mean that's you know i mean that's that's what it is and you're dealing with a super saturated market so let me ask you so you got some let's just say you've got some some you know 20 some odd year old kid who's uh just out of college and he's looking to kind of break in like what's the advice that you give him start your own pod start your own blog what do you uh like give him the the direction of where he goes yeah Definitely do your write as much as possible. I mean, you only get better with more writing. And actually, one thing that I think, I think if you read a lot, it helps your writing. It sounds crazy, but I think if you kind of see different styles and, you know, say, oh, I kind of like what this guy did here and then kind of make it your own. Don't copy it exactly, but just read a lot of different things. Oh, I like that style. Oh, I like this. And then put it in practice. And obviously podcasting. Look. A lot of these podcasts, people are boring, man. They really are. It's just and, – and here's the thing. Sometimes you don't realize it until you hear it. I'll give you a story. So I did play a color commentary for a high school baseball game. This guy was doing play-by-play. He knew I wanted to get into radio, and he said, hey, will you do the color? I said, sure, because I looked at it as now I'm going to get some more stuff for my demo tape. So we were doing a high school baseball game in Brooklyn. It was cold, windy. You know how baseball is in the Northeast, March, April. Mm-hmm. So we did it. And I was like, oh, I think I did pretty good. Got the tape, listened to it. I was horrible. Sounded like I didn't want to be there. Sounded dead. And I, when I heard that, I was like, wow, it was eye-opening. And I said, I'm never going to sound like that. You know, you got to understand, you need to be entertaining. You need to have energy. No one wants to turn on, you know. And a lot of people, I don't know, and some people don't have the personality. You might not be a podcaster, you know, and find that out early on, but you got to go back and listen. And I think people don't listen to what they do. When you do, you'll hear it. And if you're objective, because I heard it, I was like, man, that is bad. Never going to happen again. So, you know, you got to figure out what your strength is. You might not be a podcaster. You might not be entertaining. You might not be able to portray information. Maybe you're a better writer. Maybe you're better on video. So kind of just find your passion and work towards it. Obviously, with writing, you're going to have to find a way to be different, maybe come up with something. Uh, because like you said, there's just so many people doing it. And now you kind of nif- need to be different and stand out. That's what people are going to look for. If it's similar to what everyone's doing, it's hard to stand out. Which is definitely, it's, it's advice that I give as well. And that is, you know, started off. And you're right, you know, like people don't listen to what they sound like on the podcast. It's, it's kind of funny because I know exactly what you're saying. I went back and I listened to myself the first couple of times that I was doing uh, you know, the guest spot on Rotowire and it was, it was me and DVR and Jeff Erickson and, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, obviously there's nobody smoother than, than Derek Van Riper, uh, on the air. So, you know, you obviously kind of want to emulate and, and do something there. And so then I was like, okay, fine. I got to pick up the energy and be a little bit more entertaining. And I think, you know, obviously my theater and stand up background obviously help with that. 
But I remember I went the, the total opposite way when I started hosting shows. And uh, you, you saw Private Parts, right? Yeah. When, when Howard Stern, when he does the, uh, when he's in Detroit, and he's like, hey, this is Howard Stern. This is WWE, -E -E -E, you know, and he does that voice. And then he has that real moment where he does the read. And all of a sudden, he becomes more natural, and he finds his voice. And I think that that is, it's, it's a very tough thing for somebody to actually get, to be comfortable enough in their own skin to know that they can bring the energy, they can be entertaining, but they also have to be themselves and not right. be that stereotypical radio announcer type guy. And I think it's it's a very fine line, and you're right. Do as much podcasting as you can, but you have to go back and listen to it. It's like, it's like writing a, an article and not proofreading it. Right. You know, and how are you ever going to get better um, if that happens? Um, what are some of the things, what, what, what did you used to do that differentiated yourself, um, you know, coming up through the ranks? Because, yeah, you know, you worked with Angle at Roto Experts, you were on Sirius XM, but I mean, your staying power is really what it's all about. And you're not just, you don't have staying power just because you've been doing it for so long. You have staying power because you've got uh, a hook that people really love to listen. They're compelled to listen to you. And it's not just your, you know, expert NBA picks. It's the personality as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm sarcastic. That's how I am in real life too. So like, you no. just have to, you have to be yourself. You know, look, either people, you know, in the in the entertainment industry, there are going to be people who love you, and there are going to be people who hate you. It's just the way it is. There's probably people who just don't like my personality, or I was too. <laughs> too vulgar or too much sexual innuendo like on the more like when we did the morning show there was a lot of that like i felt like we were kind of like the howard stern of fantasy there was a lot of stuff going on and some people don't like that some people are straight laced so i understand not everyone's gonna like you so i just did myself i'm sarcastic but as far as fantasy is i win um and i think people respect that you know if you check a lot of the standings i'm, I'm usually near the top i'm not gonna win every league but like Tower Wars, six years in, I haven't finished lower than fifth. You know, I pride myself on being successful and fighting to the end. You know, like I didn't have a great year in the Great Fantasy Baseball Invitational last year. To the first year, I won my league. Uh, last year, it was the League of Champions. So all the teams that won their league were in a league together. And I knew two months in, I'm like, this is not a team that's going to win. But I never gave up. I never quit. Worked the waiver wire. I finished sixth or seventh. It's not great, but I didn't quit. And I didn't finish near the bottom. So um, I, th it's just my way in life. I don't quit. I fight to the end. So I think people respect that I'm near the top and continuously have success in leagues. And I think that's someone you want to take advice from because – and it's an argument too. I don't know where you stand on this because there are so, – I will say there's a lot of people in this in industry who deliver great information, can break down players. They cannot form successful fantasy teams. They're just not good at roster construction. And, you know, respect to Glenn Colton and Rick Wolf, not because I work with them, uh, because they'll ask me, what do you think of my team? And I always tell them, it doesn't matter what I think. I can think your team sucks. I know right. by the end of the year, you're going to be near the top. I might not agree with your roster construction and we disagree on players, but they're always in competition. They're going to be years where they don't win. Maybe they have a bad team here or there. All of us. It's going to happen to everyone. But like we were in a league together last year and they finished third. I think I was fourth. Um, so I know that they're going to be near the top. And, you know, I, I asked this maybe a year ago, a couple of times. I even might even had a show on it. Like for those that are listening, what's more important to you? Do you want to see someone that delivers you good information and helps you win and you don't care how they do in their league? Or do you want to take advice from the guy who is consistently winning or consistently near the top? Um, and I don't know um, where I think it's you obviously want the good information and the guy who wins. All right. That validates it. It's like you don't want to go to um, like a doctor who has terrible reviews and doesn't know what he's doing. Right. You want to see it applied that he's taking care of you. And I don't know if that comparison is fair for fantasy uh, because there are people I think who deliver great information can present it. But I don't think they play the game well. There's a there's a difference between breaking down players, giving information and then taking that and building a roster and having success in fantasy. I think they're two different things. I, I definitely think that they're two different things. I think you're 100 percent right, and and that is a, a valid question. Who would you rather take fantasy advice from? You know, I've always prided myself as far as my work goes is that I'm much more I'm much more interested in in making the right call for somebody else than I am 
for my own teams. And I'll, you know, I mean, no, obviously I'm, I'm not going to be happy finishing in last or, you know, or, or anything like that. And that's not going to be something that we're going to, you know, you're going to consistently see from me stuff happens and what are you going to do? But, you know, again, I see for me, it's, it's more about like, I'm not, I'm, you know, I, I gamble, I bet. All right. But I mean, I don't, I'm not one of those people who, you know, needs the action on so many things. Do you, have you seen Uncut Gems yet? I didn't see it yet. And that's a movie that I probably am going to watch in the next few days because it's a uh, rental and I, I wanted to see it. I, again, like I said, I don't go to the movies much. I was about to go see it. Um, I, yeah, I'd asked someone to go and they took me somewhere else. I can't say where we went. I don't know if it's appropriate for this show. <laughs> ooh, ooh. What does it rhyme with? What does it rhyme with? Um, <laughs> it might give it away. <laughs> um, does it rhyme with Biddy Car? Biddy Car? Bitty Car. Minty Car? You said? I can't, what, what did you say? I'm in the <laughs> desert. It's Let me just get really close to the microphone and ask. <laughs> Uh, but no, I wanted to go see it for sure. And I had intentions to go watch into the movies, but I haven't. So that might be in the next few days, something that I watch. See the, the, the gambling aspect for that. I mean, it's, it's intense. It's definitely intense. I think you'll like the movie a lot. Um, it, it's gives you a little odd. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie, but you know, like that aspect of it, it's more important for me, but I also, you know, I play in the Westgate Super Contest. I play in the Golden Nugget. So, I, you know, I feel like I've made a substantial enough investment in my picks week in and week out that I feel comfortable doing that. But, I mean, as far as, like, like that's, that's one of the things that we see a lot in this industry. And as our industry is kind of moving over from fantasy towards a lot more sports wagering, it's who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to the guy who bets regularly or, you right. know, and puts his money his where his money. mouth is or the guy who just makes calls all willy nilly? Right. The guy who's putting up his money and you know that he's suffering and it's on the line. And, you know, when we do alarm after hours, when we had games, you could hear me and Justin sweat. I mean, because we did have money on the line um, and, you know. How much you invest is different for everyone, but I was investing in those games. You know, the picks that I gave out, uh, I was using those picks, and you know, so I'm if if I'm if I have an 0 three night, I might have had one of them since I put the wager alarm picks out. I was hurting too. I mean, but again, most of the picks were good. But you got to understand, there's peaks and valleys. Like right before the NBA stopped, I was on a cold streak, man. Um, I. I think the last night on Wager Alarm, I think I was 1-0. I had the – no, no. I had one game that night, and it was the Pelicans-Kings game that got suspended. Um, but my personal parlays, uh, I wasn't hitting them. And I had like eight or nine in February, which is a lot. And I even said on air, I said, look, you're not going to be profitable with parlays long term. I know this. I was just going through a streak that was going real well. But I knew that it was going to turn around. Like, they want you to put three, four, five team parlays out. They're just right. not profitable long term. I was just on a nice streak. And it was house money. That's why I kept doing it. It's like, okay, well, I'm taking some of the money I want and to see if I can, you know, triple, five exit, six exit. But it was st- – and I, I was starting to pull back. I'm like, all right, I'm getting cold here. I don't know what's going on. But pull back. But you got to understand there's peaks and valleys. So you just want to profit. And you just don't want to get buried – and say, well, now I got to win everything back. And and that's something that, that people have to learn. I call it discipline. But we all know, we've seen the stories. It's scary. People don't have it. I'm fortunate that I do have it. And I know, all right, yeah, I, lo- I lost my last three parlays. Now I'm going to put all the money I lost and try again. No, no, no. Can't do that. Uh, and you got to understand when you're just not in a group. You know, I started the season poorly, then it got hot. And again, right before it was shut down, I was struggling a little bit and you got to scale back a little bit and kind of figure out, all right, what's what's going wrong with the process? Am I doing something wrong? Is it something I'm not seeing? Is it just, you know, that time of the NBA season? Because we saw a lot of good teams losing to garbage teams. And I was taking money lines, like, uh, of the favorites. That's what I was doing with my parlays. I was taking, like, you know, two or three substantial favorites and then finding that one underdog or that one team that was getting plus six, plus seven that I liked. And there were favorites that were like minus 5,000, minus 3,000 that were losing. So you weren't even getting the money. Like they were losing straight up. And I think we would just hit that portion of the NBA season in March where 
you know, teams kind of just coasting to the playoffs. The cool down. You got to learn to walk away. Absolutely. I'm, I'm with you. All right. So so let's see. What, what have we learned about Adam Ronis here so far? We've heard about how he got started. Uh, we heard that he was a, uh, a an unruly, obnoxious kid. Uh, covering Wait, up so what, the Babe Ruth story? Dude, you covered up Babe Ruth's face, dude. Come on. He had a Yankee uniform on. That's why. He's a guy who puts his money where his mouth is. It's just as important to win the leagues as it is to give great advice. Yeah. I like look, that. I, I under, look, our job here is to help mm-hmm. people win, give them information to win. That's primarily what we're here for. But I do think, and you know, people can answer this, I think it it validates who you're getting your information from. Like, okay, there's one guy giving out information. And it's great information. But you look at his track record. He's really not winning leagues. He's in the middle of the pack. He's near the bottom. Never seen him win a league. And then you got a guy who's continuously, you know, near the top, very competitive. And the information that he's giving you, he's also drafting those players. I think that's kind of important too. You know, if I write an article and say, hey, this guy's a sleeper, he's on a value. And then you look at my drafts and I don't have him anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a second. You told me you love this guy. Why isn't he on any of your teams? Right. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm, I'm, listen, I, I definitely get that. I definitely get that. And, you know, nothing worse than just turning around to somebody and be like, well, you know, I heard you slept with my sister and you didn't call her. So I just gave you the wrong play. I mean, that's that's been a, a standard. That's been a standard response of mine on Twitter when somebody's like, oh, man, you totally screwed me by telling me to start this guy instead of this guy. But nevertheless, all right, so what else? Let's see. He's single, ladies, but he's got a very specific type. So you're going to have to follow him on Twitter, at Adam Ronis, and slide a photo into his DMs. Uh, and he'll either uh, he'll either swipe left or swipe right for you. I don't know if it works like that on Twitter. It probably does. On Twitter, no. But on uh, <laughs> some other dating sites, yes, that's how it works. I'm out of the game, dude. Are you on dating sites? Yes. What are you? What are you on? Are you on Bumble? On Twitter? On on uh, on Grinder? On Grind, dude? You, I don't know. I don't know any of these places. All right, when we when we get off, look up Grinder, and then you'll see why I gave you the face. Um, but Tinder, yes. Oh, look at it right now. Here we go. Tinder. Go ahead. <laughs> Tinder and Bumble, yes. Tinder I'm, and Bumble. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Grinder. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Hey, man, to each his own. I don't know. It's not my thing. That's all. Not your thing. Right. I didn't even know this exists. This is the first time I'm on here. Now my wife is going to look at my search history. history right? Like, oh, you're in trouble, bro. She's like, Howard, we need to talk. You can be like, what? And she's going to start <laughs> asking you things. <laughs> she's like, you spend an awful lot of time talking to that Ronis character. I'm going to be like, it's, he's adorable. Why wouldn't I? Um, all right, so... Here. Binge watching uh, of Impractical Jokers is a must. Yes, if you, I mean, I'll watch it whenever it's on. Uh, I've seen, I think I've seen almost every episode. I'm not sure. I might have missed a couple of early ones. Uh, the other day I was watching, I'm like, oh, I didn't see this one, and I did. Uh, I just maybe didn't remember like the first part of it. Um, but yeah, I actually need some shows to binge watch. You have any suggestions right now? Uh, you know, you I got threw on Shit's Creek. So thank you for how, that. How that was great good, was that? Right. Yeah. Well, again, the problem is, see, I've got I, you and I have very similar senses of humor. And, and you know, I had to, like, convince my wife that we should be watching Curb on a regular basis and, and and go from there. So, I, you know, I dig for some of the comedies. But being the old married guy, I don't really get a whole lot of say in what see, we're yeah. watching. And oh, stuff. Like, I, I have to like I have to like sneak things like the Jack Ryan special with uh, John Krasinski. Like, I had to watch that when she would, like, go to bed. And I'd be like, all right, I'm going to watch this now uh, and go from that. But I, I need – so are you more of a you – I mean, Homeland versus Impractical Jokers versus Curb. So are you more in the comedy or are you more in the drama? Both. I mean, I love comedy. Comedy is one of my favorite things. I've been to, like, ten different comedy clubs, I believe, in New York City. I've been to so many. I love that. That's That's actually one of my favorite – um, dates to do is go to a comedy club. Actually, I haven't been to one in a while, and I probably won't be one uh, for several months now with the way the world is, unfortunately. Although I did get an email from one of the comedy clubs that they're actually streaming comedy on their website. It was like five bucks. Really? Uh, yeah, they were going to have comic, uh, I think it was Stand Up New York, which is like 78th and Broadway. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I love comedy, going to comedy clubs, and, you know, uh, so I'm a big comedy guy. 
but I also like some of the drama stuff. You know, Power was a big show that I just watched um, that I liked a lot that just ended, but they're coming out with other ones. Uh, Better Call Saul watching now. I saw the latest episode okay. last night. Um, but yeah, I gotta I gotta come up with some shows to binge watch because I really don't have anything now. Did you ever watch uh, I'm Dying Up Here? No, that's good. There you go. All right, I got Nick's is because it also shows you like the the sort of seedy side of being in the comedy business. Really? Um, ask Lisa Ann. Her she's buddies with uh, Eric Griffin. Right. And he's yeah. and he's in it, and he's he's phenomenal. I love watching him. So yeah, I'm dying up here. That's something that you should uh, you should check out. I don't know if they're bringing it back. Is that, again. is that a series or just like a one two hour thing? No, no, no. It was a series. Okay. Is that on Netflix? Showtime or 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 HBO? One of those. One of those. Yeah, I'll, I'll recommend. I'll all right. recommend. Um. All right. Well, anything you want to share about you with the audience before we get on out of here? We've uh, we've dazzled them for at least an hour now, but. I feel like we're only scratching the surface of who Adam Rodas is. Yeah, there's uh, a lot more. Uh, I don't even know where to go into now, but unfortunately, some of these stories are not appropriate for this environment. Okay, all right. <laughs> I mean, you know, listen, I, I don't, I definitely don't need to hear about you going and picking up a lady and what happened there, but. Um, God, give me something, give me, give me something dark, something dark, dark, dark. Uh, I don't know, man. I don't have anything for you right now. That's appropriate. Give me something funny then. That's just not appropriate. Is, is your whole life inappropriate, Adam? Is this what we're getting? Some of it is, man. As I reflect back on that, that's not a good day, right? I got just give and take. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got to reflect back, man, and, and see. I might have did a lot of things that were inappropriate, but I got to make up for it now. Well, then I'll tell you what. What? We're going to have to do another Meet the Family with Adam Rodas, and we're going to come back, and Adam's just going to – it's going to be story time. We'll do story time with Adam Rodas, and, uh, and we'll warn everybody that it's probably not going to be family-friendly. And I need you guys to sign something that you're not going to let me go after it? Oh, yeah, dude, dude, with my life? <laughs> dude, let me tell you something, man. I mean, and, and the, everybody knows about my life and what I've done in the past and what I do in the present and everything like that. I mean, come on. I've woken up in a construction dumpster at 530 in the morning on the west side, uh, on West 53rd Street is where it was, like over by like between 9th and 10th Avenue. A construction oh, okay. dumpster. Can I tell you about that night? No, you did it. Yeah, see? Not family friendly. Were so you they, next to? Did you wake up next to Vito? No, no. I literally <laughs> woke up in a heap of garbage because construction workers were throwing out their old coffee cups as they were getting ready to go to work. That's how I woke up. Why but were you was, in there? Why was I? Because I, I, I guess I crawled in there to go to sleep. I don't know. I blacked out. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, partying in New York in my uh, in my twenties, dude. Come on. I mean, you yeah. know. That right, leads to some uh, crazy things. Right. Well, we'll save that for a meet the family of Howard Bender. We'll dive into those inner secrets. In the meantime, Adam, I want to thank you for for your time today. We wish you nothing but the best. That you're gonna get your steps in. Yes. That you you won't be lonely, and that sports won't be gone for too long, so that you can resume this happy go lucky life of yours. Look, I got WhatsApp video to you know. Talk to women, so got that at least. Got that going for you. Yeah. Which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for us here today. Tune in tomorrow, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern. Meet the family, Jen Piacenti. I wonder if Adam Ronis is going to tune in and start throwing her questions uh, about her life. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to want to know. All right, what? Come on. I know. I see it. Yeah, see we'll, see, we'll see if you ask those questions that I ask. I will. Okay. I will. I'm bound by a, by a host's responsibility. Okay, well, there might be some uh, HR issues with some of the questions I ask. Well, then why would you do that, man? Why, you don't... said you're going to ask anything, so I'm testing you. Okay, all right. We'll see if there's a filter. We'll see if there is a filter. So I'll tell you what, tune in tomorrow. We'll see if there's a filter. Right now, you know, Jen Piacenti's watching this, and she's, like, now nervous. She's like... 
<laughs> I got the coronavirus. I can't do the show with you. But that's going to do it for us. Big thanks to all of you guys for tuning in. Again, we're going to be doing live streams every every day, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Adam Ronis, Jen Piacenti, John and Pemba, James Grande, the whole F.A. family is going to be here. So tune in. It's going to be a lot of fun while we all anxiously await for sports to start back up. Big thanks to our producer, Matt Sells, for all the hard work he puts in. We'll catch you next time.